Hi team, welcome to the Kindness, Curiosity and Comfortable Shoes podcast. My name is James McFetridge and this is an ongoing toolkit for all healthcare staff. Whether you are a porter or a paediatrician, a domestic or a driver, clinical or non-clinical, just starting or just finishing your work in healthcare, this podcast aims to give you some useful thoughts about working for this amazing business to get you through your day. Before we start today's episode, I'll be so grateful if you could do one thing for me. If there is anything in these episodes that helps you in your day-to-day work as a healthcare worker, please tell your friends and colleagues so they can benefit from it too. I'd be so grateful if you could do that to really help grow this podcast. Thank you. Right then, night shift. This episode is one that I've been really keen to do. It's very much one of those things that I think we just don't talk enough about how to manage night shifts and there's still lots and lots of people starting work in healthcare and they're doing their first night shift and they're struggling and it's not clear how to manage it and yet there's lots of information out there that is useful to know. I think it is very individual about how you manage doing your night shift but I thought it was a good idea just to run through some fairly common things that you can find about how to cope. Night shifts are definitely the bane of any worker that there is a small group of people who seem to absolutely thrive on them almost enjoy them Uh, but certainly for me my family will tell you how much I absolutely hated night shift. I had them on and off through training in my 20s and 30s with most jobs having some form of night shift. All of them obviously had night work, but some of them were on call. In fact, my training finished with a rotation that had a week of 12-hour night shifts, seven back-to-back 12-hour night shifts. And that would mean that I'd have a week dreading them leading up to it, a week of just working and sleeping or trying to sleep, The work was absolutely full on, barely a chance to sit down and then a week recovering, trying to get back to normal sleep patterns, trying to reintegrate with society, (laughs) seeing my family again. And then four weeks later, the next block, it all start again. Now, when I started as a consultant, I wasn't doing night shifts, but when our consultant numbers were big enough and we changed things around about how we worked that we could consider doing night shift. Funny enough, I was strongly for it, not because I wanted to do it at all, but because it was the right thing to do. In emergency medicine, if there's a benefit to my skill set being available at three in the afternoon, there surely must be a benefit at three in the morning. However, starting that again uh, in my early 40s at that stage, uh, yes, as a consultant body in a position to negotiate uh, better, have better ownership of, of doing that work and we had shorter shifts that were about nine and a half hours slightly more in control but just still awful so there was nothing really that I found that helped me at that time and luckily things have changed so this is a a bit of a, a summary things that I think are helpful with some thoughts and some resources but I'm sure you'll have your own and and please feel free to share those on the social media post about this podcast or at hellokccpodcast at gmail.com I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. So with night shift funnily enough we're not alone. I looked up according to the Office of National Statistics for the UK uh, just over a quarter of the workforce about 8.7 million people are classified as nighttime workers although that is slightly oddly defined as anyone who it is usual for there to to be work in the evening and at night. So it's not all full night shifts. So the first thing I wanted to cover, mainly because no one seems to talk about this, is the effect of working night shifts on bowels. 
oh my god this is just unbelievable so there's some research that uh uh, well, lots of different studies, but up to 80% of those working or rotating through night shifts report some form of functional bowel, di bowel disorder, whether that's abdominal pain or constipation or diarrhea. And that's all because essentially your gut is used to resting at night, so it goes into a, a neutral mode, if you like. And yet, what do we do? Part of the sort of comfort way of trying to get through nights is uh, bring in unhealthy things to eat uh, things that we know are just going to get us through lots of things that give us uh, quick sugar rushes well funny enough the advice is because your gut goes into that kind of neutral state just healthy small snacks having a good meal before you start uh, your shift and then some healthy snacks uh, as you go through because all that calorie-laden food can actually worsen the effect of your night shift. Secondly, a bit about sleep. Well, I covered a bit about sleep in episode four. Feel free to go back to that episode for some tips on sleep in general. When you're on a, a night shift, having a nap before your shift, so before you start your run, trying to make the most of that after lunch, early afternoon dip in your energy levels having a nap around that time and even just having quiet time so uh it's a phrase that we had from uh, when the children were small having a bit of quiet time but just trying to manage uh, your life as best as you can to have a period of time where you can just shut down a bit possibly have a sleep possibly just sit in front of the tv i Loved watching movies that I'd watched before. It didn't matter whether I'd fallen asleep. I didn't have to think too much about it. And then during your shift, and this is really difficult for healthcare, but certainly the evidence is all for this, is that having a short nap during your shift can be of huge benefit for you. So something that's just maybe 10, 15 minutes long. Recommendation to get through that is to have, and I love this phrase, I couldn't find who came up with this, a nappuccino. So having some form of cap uh, cappuccino you could have, but any form of caffeinated drink at the start of your break and then having a nap. Now, I know what lots of you will be thinking exactly as I think about this. When do I ever get a chance to actually sit down? And that's the real difficulty with healthcare, having to carve out that opportunity to have a rest, which is really, really important. But when you're dealing with patients, they don't define when they become unwell or when they need things doing but if at all you can possibly do that trying to identify time for a break which is clearly going to be important anyway and it's probably beneficial for you to have a small nap during that break you may want to combine that with that natural dip in energy levels which happens about 4 a.m that's when you're going to be at your most sleepy and if you're unable to get a rest at that time, then being aware that is when your brain is going to be functioning at its worst. So being so careful about any decisions that you're making. And the way I got around that was very much being aware that, say, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., that I was overthinking cases. I was deliberately making sure that I was sat down, paying full attention to any patient information I was being given, that I was sharing thoughts with back with the patients, but also with the other clinicians uh, that were working with me, discussing with other people, and any significant decision that I was making, making sure I just stopped myself and double checked. And I really had to work that into that was how I operated between three and five AM because I knew that decisions that I would otherwise find easy and straightforward, even at the same time in the afternoon, I'll be very conscious that I would not be processing information in quite the same way in the middle of the night. Then there's that bit about after work, what you do. It's nice to be able to finish work and it's nice to have some control over what you're doing, but driving after a shift, if you can avoid it, if at all possible, there are far too many uh, stories and absolute tragedies of people uh, having accidents while uh, driving home. And then once you're home, 
in theory, getting straight to to beds to rest as much as you can uh, to maximise that that time where your your body and brain can can rest and hopefully sleep. Clearly, along with that comes not planning any daytime activities, but you know, we may have to do school runs, uh, may have uh, things that we need to do to to keep our world ticking over outside of work, but as much as you can, trying to cut down on any di- daytime activities. And at some point before you go back to work, some kind of exercise or fresh air uh, after your rest. Now, I'm a runner, I like running, and I just know that it's so beneficial to get out and run but I would not feel like it at all so I'd have what I would think of as a shuffle that I would try and do uh, maybe just uh, a mile or two where I would not be running in the grand scheme of things but doing a shuffle so I was getting some kind of exercise something uh, that was some physical activity that would help me. And then finally and I know I'm rushing through these but there's so much about uh, night shifts Uh, thinking about your recovery after your run of night shifts. So some kind of short sleep as soon as you can, then forcing yourself up after a few hours. And I used to set uh, an alarm after about three or four hours sleep and just use everything I had in me to drag myself out of bed because it's just so easy to stay around, keep your body on the... Uh, the clock setting of working a night shift uh, but you need as quickly as possible to get back to normal functioning hours and focus on getting a good night's sleep that first night proper night after you've finished your shift so going to bed at the normal time but that means having a day that is just horrible and you feel disgusting and uh, you just want to sleep but that's another key time to be up and out and getting some fresh air and doing something and acknowledging that it's going to be at least two nights sleep to recover from that that's often what is uh, written in the literature i would say it's a good four or five sleep cycles before you start to feel a bit normal again and being conscious that you may have a couple of nights sleep and and recover but then if you go straight back into another long day uh, another day of uh, hectic things with your family that that's really going to take its toll i hope that's a useful run through very much a rattle through lots of different things that may or may not be helpful there's loads of stuff on the internet about it but i think the best summary i found uh, which are based these uh, tips on is uh, from the Association of Anaesthetists. Some really nice uh, tips working and I will reference that in the show notes if you want to read that a bit more. But a quick Google of uh, night shift or help for night shift. There are lots and lots of resources. I would flit around and try and find the thing that makes most sense for you. But I hope that was useful for you in thinking about how to tackle night shifts. Thank you for listening today. Let me know what you thought about this episode. I am on at JMAC Education on all the socials. And there are links in the show notes for anything that we've talked about today that may be of interest or further reading for you. I'd be really grateful if you could rate, review and subscribe. And most importantly, if you found this helpful, please tell your colleagues about this podcast. So please take care of yourselves out there. You are doing a great job. And remember, be kind, be curious and don't forget your comfortable shoes. Thank you to Shakina Studio for the music downloaded through Audio Jungle. Thank you to Beth for the artwork and the photo produced through Canva. And thank you to Buzzsprout for hosting the podcast. The Kindness, Curiosity and Comfortable Shoes podcast is a JMAC Education production.